all have this experience in uh, uh, talking physics with the Nati that we go in with the uh, vague ideas uh, that are virtual. They're not quite, they're not quite real. And, um, uh, and we talk to them, and, uh, and, and talking to Nati has the tendency to, uh, uh, to collapse the wave function of the ideas in one direction or the other, and um, uh, to take them from being virtual to being on shell. So uh, that's the on shell in that sense. But um, that's, that's the way he puts all of us on shell. Uh, but there's a more specific sense in which uh, he put me on shell, I mean, in that way as well. But um, uh, <clears throat> the story goes back to uh, 2007, um, when I was uh, giving a, a talk here in the context of something that we're calling back then the LHC Olympics. Um, this was the idea that, that we're going to have so much insane new physics at the LHC that it was going to be very difficult to disentangle it all. And so we had to come up with all sorts of new and interesting methods to do it. And um, so uh, anyway, so we're having a lot, a lot of fun with it. And uh, at this meeting, I talked about something that I'd, uh, some work that I'd done a long paper in collaboration with a bunch of my students, postdocs, and some LHC experimentalists on something that we ended up calling a marmoset. Um, which was mass and rate, mass and rate matching uh, for on-shell effective theories. And the idea here was that uh, uh, there should be a much more model-independent in way of... Um, is this working? This is not working, actually, if you could... Um, there, there should be a much more model-independent way of uh, going about looking for new physics at the LHC instead of trying to match them to uh, underlying Lagrangians, models, and so on, that you would just uh, make little blobs, stick figure blobs for how the particles are produced, how they decayed, and, uh, and just try to match that to the data. So that's, that, that's what I talked about. This is not as trivial as it seems because it's not obvious that you can accurately enough model what's actually going on with an underlying uh, uh, Lagrangian without putting in all the details of the couplings, and it wouldn't be possible at an E plus E minus collider, but it's true at the LHC. It's such a messy environment, the parton distribution functions smear out a lot of the information, and so we had sort of plots like this where you could compare all sorts of different models to uh, something where you just assume a flat matrix element for the production, for example, and everything matched. So that was the, that was the content of the talk, but there was all sorts of uh, subsections with titles like particle production without a Lagrangian and so on. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I always wanted to point out, so the whole point was that we'd have some complicated thing like this, um, and that uh, some underlying supersymmetric model, and we'd, we'd uh, replace it in a more model independent way in this approach with something that looks like this. I want to point out, I wanted to point out that while none of this has happened, at least we predicted that the Higgs was at 125 GeV back then. <laughs> Except it's another example of how supersymmetry at the TV scale always makes you make a mistake. It's actually the Higgsino. Sorry. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, at the end of this uh, talk, um, uh, Nati asked me a question. Um, I, evidently, what I'd, uh, what I'd presented was, a, was a, a misleading in some way. And he asked, are you suggesting that there is some kind of new, purely on-shell formulation of field theory? <laughs> And I said, of course not. <laughs> That's completely ridiculous. Of course I'm not suggesting that. This is just some way to go about modeling things at, at the LHC for phenomenological purposes and so on. And then I came here and I've, I've spent the next uh, six, seven, eight years trying to do exactly that. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so this is the second way in which by trying to collapse me on shell back then, he ended up collapsing me on shell, on shell. <laughs> um, now, and that's uh, the topic for the rest, rest of the talk. So, a lot of things in this, uh, in this uh, journey um, go along very much with uh, uh, sayings and pictures of the world that Nazi has. A big part of the story is to get rid of, not ever talk about gauge symmetries. Um, uh, of course, a big motivation is the, uh, and, and, and hope that we're seeing aspects of what such reformulations should look like is this uh, slogan that quantum field theory needs to be reformulated. <coughs> Uh, another big motivation is to try to describe the physics completely removing any reference to, uh, to the space-time in which the particles move and uh, uh, interact with each other. <clears throat> there is only actually one aspect of it which uh, disagrees with Nazi slogans, <laughs> and Nazi always likes to tell me, to me, field theory is Euclidean. <laughs> okay? And uh, that's, that's just not the case in this, in this business. Uh, and I think it's, it's actually rather interesting. Uh, of course, uh, the real world is not Euclidean, but um, in thinking about amplitudes, you, you, you can't forget the, the fact that the real world isn't Euclidean because the question is dynamical, 
time matters, and it's most naturally Lorentzian. In fact, it's possible that it's not even most natural in Lorentzian signature. A lot of this uh, story uh, finds its most natural home in 2 comma 2 signature, which is the most symmetrical signature between space and time. <clears throat> now, so I'm sure you've all seen, we'll do some uh, quick reminders of it in a second, of, of, the, uh, of the tremendous complexity that you see when you calculate scattering amplitudes with ordinary formalisms. Um, and it goes back to the simple fact that the usual way of doing things in perturbation theory with Feynman diagrams, it makes the locality and the unitarity of the theory manifest in, um, in simple analytic properties of the amplitudes. At tree level, they only have poles. At loop level, you have cuts that correspond to internal loop momenta going on shell. And all of that is totally manifest in Feynman diagrams. <laughs> And it's totally manifest at the expense of making a simple process like two to three gluon scattering look like that. 25 pages of horrible algebra if you open up Peskin and Schroeder and copy out the Feynman rules and do the calculation, that's what you get. And yet the actual answer is something that's just one term, the famous Park-Taylor amplitude whose uh, say 30th anniversary was uh, uh, earlier this year. So <clears throat> now. Uh, that was, those amplitudes were simple. People saw that already back in the 80s. Back then it wasn't clear that it was a tip of a very big iceberg. Today it's clear it's a tip of a very big iceberg. And um, uh, most of the iceberg that's, that's been seen has been in the context of planar n equals four super Yang mills. Um, I think uh, uh, best named the hydrogen atom more than the harmonic oscillator of the, uh, of the 21st century. Um, for example, there's this famous hidden dual conformal symmetry of the theory that's actually there in any number of dimensions. So it's ironic. In any number of dimensions, there's this uh, hidden uh, symmetry. And only in four dimensions is there the obvious uh, conformal symmetry, at least at low enough loop orders for this statement at high enough dimensions. Um, and together, they, they, uh, they, they form in, in four dimensions this uh, famous infinite dimensional Yangian symmetry, uh, again, in the planar limit of the theory, which is completely invisible in the Lagrangian. So <clears throat> the amplitudes are simple. They have hidden infinite dimensional symmetries. None of that is made manifest in the usual way of thinking about field theory. And why? Um, it's because of, there is a heavy price to making locality and unitarity manifest. Even for simple theories, scalar theories, anything, uh, there is lots of redundancy. There is the redundancy of field redefinitions. And then when we have massless particles with spin, we have gauge redundancies um, in order to help us describe in a local way the dynamics of two helicities for massless uh, spin one particles, let's say, um, <clears throat> in terms of fields with things like polarization vectors and so on. We need to, uh, we need, we need to say that there's a whole equivalence class of polarization vectors that differ by translations uh, parallel to the momentum in order to knock down the degrees of freedom from the four of the polarization vectors to the two that actually describe the massless particles. Okay, so all of that uh, gives a motivation to try to uh, describe um, scattering amplitudes in, in a different way where we don't use any of the Lagrangian. We try to somehow, in the beginning anyway, uh, the first thing we can try to do is to determine the answer more directly um, going back to the basic principles of, um, of uh, uh, locality and unitarity. And a lot of the progress in this uh, business over the past 10, 15 years uh, has been doing this in the context of, of theories with massless particles. Um, part of the reason is that the massless particle dynamics uh, uh, well, of course, part of the reason is that we, as, as particle physicists, high energy physicists, we care about things in the high energy limit where we should be able to ignore the masses at zeroth order. More fundamentally, it's because the dynamics of massless particles is almost completely dictated uh, by, by Poincaré invariance, and then at, uh, for the most fundamental simple interactions, then we can try to um, build up more complicated interactions by putting these things together. So this is easiest to see. It's very simple to see in four dimensions where we have these famous uh, spinner helicity variables for writing the form momentum of a particle. <clears throat> and the, 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 conceptual, the, the, the important point about these variables conceptually is that they make the action of the little group on, uh, on the amplitudes manifest. So scattering amplitudes are not functions of, they're not Lorentz tensors. Um, uh, they have to transform. When you transform the momenta with the Lorentz transformation, they have to pick up a little group transformation on the, on the helicity labels, and that's non-trivial. We, we, we pretend that such a thing as polarization vectors exist that are like a bifundamental between the Lorentz group and the little group, and they don't actually exist. They only exist in these gauge uh, in these gauge-dependent equivalence classes, and that's the origin of the complexity. So what you'd like to do is find variables on which the little group acts nicely, directly, 
And that's what these spinner helicity variables are. See, the whole point is that here is a null momentum, and here is something you can do to rephase or rescale lambda and lambda tilde by opposite amounts that leaves the p invariant, and that's precisely the action of the little group. Now, furthermore, the, <coughs> the uh, kinematics of momentum conservation is especially simple for three particles, and, uh, and by familiar arguments, you can uh, fully determine what the three-particle amplitude is once you specify the helicities with two different choices depending on whether some of these helicities uh, is positive or negative. <coughs> and then you can ask a simple question. The three-particle amplitudes are fixed up to an overall constant. Now you can ask, you can assume that there's some underlying theory of the weak coupling so that you're talking about something like a tree approximation. So the amplitude is only going to have poles. Uh, so we're restricting ourselves to theories like that. <coughs> but then the requirement of unitarity is just that the four-particle amplitude should factorize correctly. You have to somehow write down a four-particle amplitude. This thing can now depend on st and u, as well as just helicity information. But you have to make sure that as, uh, let's say, s goes to zero, it factorizes correctly in the product of the, uh, the three-particle amplitude. Okay, now you might think this is really easy to do. So let's say I have a phi cube theory. Uh, it's completely trivial to build a four particle amplitude that does this because um, let's say you want to match residues somewhere. You would first go there and see what the residue is. So the amplitude is just a constant times a constant for the three particle case. You, you get G times G, it's G squared, and say, I know how I'm going to match the uh, residues. I'll just multiply by one over S minus M squared, and I sum over the different channels. Okay? So that's a, that seems to be trivial. Once you know the three particle amplitudes, you figure out the residues, you dress with the one over, uh, you dress with the pole factors that you had stripped off and you're done. <clears throat> but it's non-trivial when, uh, when we have massless particles with spin for the following very simple reason. If you go compute the, uh, the residue in the S channel, let's say for this uh, uh, helicity configuration, I'm assuming these are all particles of a single spin S, a massless particle of a single spin S, you discover that you can compute the residue, but it's not local. The residue in the S channel is not local. It has a 1 over T in it. See, so that's tricky now. So now, now it's not obvious. Uh, now you, want, you, you might want to take that guy and, sh and shove a 1 over S in front of it, but now it's not obvious it's going to give you the right answer because it has a, it, it has a T in it. It's not obvious that it's going to give you a right answer when you go to the other channel. In this case, when S equals 1 and S equals 2, well, in this case, there's a T. Um, and you can do it because if you actually just multiply this whole thing by 1 over ST, thankfully, there's also a pole on the T channel that's supposed to be there, and it's, it's exactly right. <laughs> Now, this looks a little scarier. There's a 1 over t squared if you do it for spin 2. Uh, that might make it look like you'd have to have double poles in the denominator, and that's, uh, that's wrong. But no, no, it's, it's OK, because, uh, because it's gravity. That, that t squared could really be a t times u when s equals 0. And the full amplitude is allowed to have a pole in s, and a pole in t, and a pole in u. OK? So that's why we can now directly write down the four-particle amplitude. We just take the residue. Well, we say it had to be s times uh, it has to be t times u. Then we multiply it by one over s, and everything works. Okay. But you see that it's not trivial uh, because uh, because of the poles in the other channels. And this is the I think the the most invariant way of seeing the tension between locality and unitarity. Uh, for massless particles with spin, even more invariant than talking about the need for gauge redundancy with, with a Lagrangian, because it's reflected directly in the structure of what the amplitude is. <laughs> if I give you the amplitude for phi cube theory, it looks like a sum over the s and t and u channels. But if I give you the amplitude for Yang, oh, for this is gravity, uh, it can simply not be written as a sum over different channels, okay, in a Lorentz invariant way. So, uh, and of course, we can break. We can, we can write it as a sum of channels in a Lorentz non-invariant way. That would be like doing a calculation in a light cone gauge or something like that. Okay, but that's just, we see precisely this tension between Lorentz invariance, locality, and unitarity. By the way, this is also the one-line explanation for why there's no, no such thing as maximal off-shell superspace. Okay? If you do exactly the same uh, computation uh, in a maximally supersymmetric theory, this numerator just turns into a big supersymmetric delta function. <laughs> And so you imagine if there was a theory with, uh, uh, with had uh, maximal off-shell superspace, then you would be able to compute in Feynman diagrams in that theory and get an expression with a sum over S and T and U channels, and you just can't do it. Every single term would have to have this delta 16 Q in it, and once you strip that off, it's simply not a sum of a function of S, T, and U. So this tension between Lorentz invariance and unitarity for massless particles is related to the tension between supersymmetry and locality that we all know and complain about as we make supersymmetric theories with more and more supersymmetry, they're harder and harder
harder to describe in Lagrangian language, okay? And it's very closely related to the, uh, uh, to the uh, tension, um, <coughs> to the need for gauge redundancy when we describe these things with uh, Lagrangians. All right, now we can keep going. <coughs> um, and this is an exercise that's possible to do very systematically. It's been done uh, in a number of uh, nice ways in the past uh, uh, couple of years. Um, uh, the presence of massless higher spin particles uh, from these considerations can be just ruled out by the presence of gravity or Yang-Mills. I'll just give an example of charged massless particles, charged under a photon, of spin S. You do the same exercise, you compute the residue in the S channel, and now you find that it has a 1 over U to the 2S minus 1 in front of it. And the second S is 3 halves or above, now, now you're dead. There's nothing you can do. You're forced to have a, a double pole, multiple pole in the denominator, and it's just impossible. And you, can, and you can do an exercise where you conclude that the only possible consistent four-point amplitudes that you can have correspond to theories that have particles of spin zero, half, one, three halves, and two. Two has got to be unique. You can only have eight of these guys. That's Yang Mills, all the theories that we know and love. Just to give you a, a small example, how do you discover supersymmetry like this? Okay? So you, you put in massless particles of spin three halves. That's no problem. They interact with gravity. It's no problem. But now let's say you add one scalar to the theory for fun. Now you look at the amplitude for the spin three half scalar scattering, and you discover that when you look at the T channel residue, it has an S channel pole. Okay, so the only way it can possibly be consistent is that if there are a particle in the S channel that could make that up, and that's the superpartner of the scalar. So, so, uh, so all of these things come out in a very, very simple way. All right. So, anyway, so that's uh, um, so uh, so that's just that four particles is very it's very simple, but um, uh, in a sense, a lot of the modern S-matrix S program is trying to go beyond this to t talk about things, more particles, more loops, and so on. Um, and the, the philosophy is to exploit locality and unitarity, just like we did in this very simple example, to determine the amplitudes with more sophisticated ideas, things like generalized unitarity, BCFW recursion relations, leading singularities, and so on. <clears throat> but there's a converse philosophy that I think is also interesting uh, uh, to a... Uh, to a take, which is the, the fact that making these things manifest uh, obscures all these marvelous structures suggests that we should look for a new picture for what the amplitudes really are, where the space-time and Hilbert space um, don't appear. And if we can find such a picture, then we can understand how locality and unitarity might emerge as derived notions from uh, something else. And this is a very concrete setup where you know exactly what these things mean. You have functions you have to match. They have to have the right, uh, they have to have the right singularity properties and so on. And uh, so uh, you can either use these principles to determine them or you could look for some other structure that generates them in a different way. <clears throat> now, I want to just say a, a few things about uh, this last point, that, uh, that we might look for something where locality and unitarity sort of emerge from uh, other principles. I just want to say a, a few general things about it, which is a very, very speculative uh, idea. But I, I first uh, got excited about this idea um, by, by a talk that Nati gave at the Solvay meeting back in 2005. There he is. Um, and uh, of course, everyone talks about uh, emergent space, quantum emergent space from a quantum mechanics, and not to make the point forcefully that, of course, we have to care about emergent space time. And if time is emergent, it's not obvious that quantum mechanics has got to be just left alone, that it's just going to commute and go along with the ride. Um, this is, uh, 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 I'm sure other people have said it before, but it was said very clearly and very forcefully. It made a very big impression on me back then. And just to uh, sort of contrast what uh, what, what, I'm, uh, what, I'm, what, what, what the, the hope or the idea is here is that uh, instead of imagining that there's, uh, there's uh, quantum mechanics and it gives us emergent space, and of course we believe this happens and, and we'd like to understand more and better how it happens, here it's something uh, much vaguer at the moment, uh, but the idea that there's something else and, and out of it comes both quantum mechanics and not just space, but space-time, uh, and that they have to emerge together, somehow joined uh, inexorably. I just want to give a, a couple of, uh, these, are, these are some general remarks, but I want to just give a, a couple of, of broad motivations for this, because I think there are some big reasons to expect it and some little uh, uh, circumstantial hints to expect it. <clears throat> One, of course, is we all know that uh, we eventually run out of precise quantum observables 
uh, in, in various uh, questions that we like to think about in following observers into black holes, accelerating cosmologies, and so on. And so we look for quantum mechanical observables, and we eventually run out of them. And so uh, we don't know what we're supposed to be talking about. So there, there's at least uh, a place where it's, it's conceivable there might be some kind of extension of quantum mechanics needed. There's something else which uh, uh, certainly bugs me, I'm sure it bugs many, many people, is that there's this huge tension between the two revolutions uh, of the 1990s. On the one hand, um, we got this uh, idea, especially in the flat space limit, that there's this one unique theory and they're all dual to each other and we can have uh, uh, all, these different, uh, all these different possible backgrounds as solutions of one theory. That's one picture, then we have the ADS-CFT picture where more or less any old quantum system is dual to a, uh, an ADS theory in the bulk. And these two things just don't feel the same as each other, right? Um, so it, it, doesn't seem, it doesn't seem crazy that there might be some more bulk-flavored picture of the physics. And since there's no local observables, quantum local observables, maybe that more bulk-flavored picture of the physics will be more relaxed about quantum mechanics. It's a absolutely wild speculation, but, um, but it at least motivates you to, to look for this, motivates you to, to look for things where it's not just the, 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 the Hilbert space, which is dominant, but that uh, uh, somehow both sets of concepts should come out together. Now, I think there's other more elementary circumstantial clues. <clears throat> one is that um, our, our best pictures of field theory don't start in three plus one dimensions. <clears throat> For example, most, most standardly, uh, we start in Euclidean space where the objects that we talk about don't have the interpretation of amplitudes, nor is there any time. And then we do an analytic continuation, and the second time emerges, they become probabilistic. They have, the, they have a quantum interpretation <clears throat> at the same moment. And there are some uh, analogous things that's being seen in the context of amplitudes where you start uh, uh, from uh, 2 plus 2 signature. <clears throat> and there's the other sort of basic fact that, uh, that, that uh, uh, local space-time and quantum mechanics somehow buttress each other. Um, if it wasn't for the, if it wasn't for, uh, if, if, if it, if there was no quantum mechanics, we could have imagined that Lorentz invariance was an approximate long distance symmetry, just like uh, waves on a rope. Um, but it's quantum fluctuation that makes it very, very hard to get Lorentz invariance to come out as uh, approximate symmetry. If it wasn't for quantum, if it wasn't for uh, Lorentz invariance and causality, you could imagine making stupid local hidden variable models for quantum mechanics. It's uh, relativity that makes quantum mechanics more, uh, more, more rigid. All right, and the final thing most closely tied to the, uh, the subject of the talk <coughs> is that um, uh, the locality and unitarity of scattering amplitudes are reflected in sort of one and the same property of these objects. Just the singularities of the amplitudes naturally tie both locality and unitarity together. Okay, so <coughs> now um, I'm gonna, uh, here are the two things that I wanna talk about depending on how I'm doing for time. Um, uh, we may not uh, cover them equally. <clears throat> but the two topics I want to talk about are, uh, first, uh, <clears throat> the final answer to Nati's question. So, um, so he asked me back then if we were talking about, uh, uh, with these on-shell effective theories for collider physics, if, we're, if we wanted to eliminate virtual particles there. And I said, of course not. <clears throat> and now I want to uh, tell you exactly how, how we can do that, not just for, you know, Th theories with massless particles, but just normal standard model processes. What are the uh, S-matrix rules, in fact, in general, for any masses and any spins? And this is work in progress with the uh, Yutin Huang and uh, uh, Chu Chu Huang, <coughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's motivated by, by, by uh, uh, trying to better understand um, uh, four-particle scattering amplitudes for general uh, uh, string states in uh, string theory, but I won't talk about that, that part. I'll just tell you about how to go about thinking about uh, the S matrix for general mass and spin. <clears throat> so that's uh, in the S matrix program direction, and in the opposite direction of trying to find uh, a different set of questions that the amplitudes are, are answering. Uh, that's something that, that I've been working on for uh, many years. Um, and uh, there's structures, interesting structures in, in combinatorics and algebraic geometry that have shown up. Uh, and uh, and the, uh, the, I think, most invariant way we've found so far of thinking about these things is uh, uh, something being, that's being done in, in collaboration with uh, Hugh Thomas, a mathematician at the uh, University of Montreal and Yaroslav Trinka, 
which, uh, which um, tells us to, first of all, think about scattering amplitudes as differential forms, and uh, secondly, they're seeing that they're actually completely specified by a pattern of string bits, pluses and minuses. Uh, there is, in a very specific sense, they're, they're a binary code. All right, so um, first, uh, the S matrix rules for general mass and spin. <clears throat> And what's, what's hard about this? Well, when we have, uh, when we have massive particles, um, we also have a little group. The little group is uh, SU2 in, uh, in three plus one dimensions. But how do we actually do it? The, we, we don't, just as for massless particles, we don't normally use objects that transform nicely under the little group, right? We use polarization vectors for spin one particles. And then we have to force them to satisfy that they're transverse. P mu epsilon mu is zero. Or let's say for spin a half, we use solutions of the Dirac equation. That's also a constrained object. You know, it's a four component object that satisfies P slash minus M U equals zero. The actual labels for an electron are two, spin up or down, right? The actual labels for, uh, uh, okay. So, <clears throat> so what we want is to do exactly the same thing we did for massless particles, to just find the objects uh, that transform nicely into the little group. Now, fortunately, in four dimensions, life is maximally simple because the massless little group is U1, and we've talked about it, and the massive little group is SU2, and uh, SU2 is the easiest representation theory in the world. Irreps of SU2 are just symmetric tensors, and that's the way we should think about things. So instead of thinking, the, the, the point is that we can use the momentum of the particle to transform alpha to alpha dot indices, and because the little group is exactly the thing that leaves the mass invariant, uh, if we transform to, let's say, all alpha indices or all alpha dot indices, we can just demand that the objects are symmetric tensors carrying those indices, and we're done. So, for instance, instead of saying we have a polarization vector, which is transverse, I just say I have this object, which is symmetric, and then I can, uh, I can use a P over M to take this to that, and that will automatically be transverse so long as that's symmetric. Okay, so that's how we label them, first of all. They're labeled by a symmetric tensor of SU2. <clears throat> and the formulas are naturally chiral. That's good. The world is chiral. Uh, there's a very simple action of parity. And if you want to uh, decompose the spins into a particular basis, um, for example, we can always decompose the momentum as a sum of two pieces like this. Uh, then the different helicity components, uh, the different spin components are just projected out by contracting this tensor with the, with the some appropriate numbers of these lambdas and these etas. If you like, the etas specify the z direction. Okay, so now we know uh, that the amplitudes are, are labeled by symmetric tensors um, uh, for the massive guys and just the usual uh, lambdas and lambda tildes with the correct helicity weight for the massless ones. Now let's do the same thing we did before. We just go through one by one and write down all the three particle amplitudes. Okay? So here is the amplitude for two massless and one massive particle. And so all I have to, all I have to remember, uh, there's the only difference here is now this, this product is uh, m squared. I have to just write down something that has the right number of indices. Downstairs, the only things I have available are the lambda of this particle, the lambda of that particle. I can write down some power of this to make up the helicity weights, and I'm done, okay? So if I specify the helicities here and the spin here, there's a unique structure that I can write down. <clears throat> uh, this makes it, for instance, uh, things like Yang's theorem, that a spin one particle can't decay to two massless photons is trivial. It's trivial just because you can't, that these numbers have got to be positive, okay? And uh, you also discover that a massive spin one particle can't decay to two gravitons, and a massive spin three particle can't decay to two gravitons, and so on, okay? <clears throat> Now, this formalism also makes it really easy to compute what the residues are when you exchange particles. That's the other headache when, if you try to do these things with polarization vectors, is that there are constrained objects, you have to take out traces, and, uh, and that's where Legendre, Gegenbauer polynomials, and so on uh, arise when you do these things concretely. Well, here it's trivial because you just match up the indices from one side to the other. <clears throat> so for instance, if I have just any general helicities on the outside, this is the residue that I'm supposed to get. And uh, you may not recognize it, but in the case where these are all scalars, this is a way of writing the Legendre polynomials, and of course it uh, uh, generalizes trivially. All right, <clears throat> so that case is easy. Let's do the next one. This is the interesting one. Two massive and one massless. <clears throat> and, uh, and here what's going on is that, um, uh, again, I have this one massless guy. <clears throat> I have to write down things that have downstairs uh, alpha indices. Now what I can do is use the lambda for this guy, and, uh, and I can use the momentum for one or two uh, times a lambda tilde to get something also with a downstairs alpha index. Fortunately, these are equal and opposite to each other. So I have two two-dimensional vectors, u and v. <coughs> and the, the overlap between them is m1 squared minus m2 squared. So there's two different cases. One is if the masses are unequal, then these two vectors just give a basis. 
And so I can expand, I, I, can, uh, I can expand every possible three particle amplitude in a basis of some number of U's and some number of V's. And the total number of U's and V's is fixed by the helicity weights of the, of the particles. So there's, if you have spin S, for example, there's two S plus one structures that you're allowed to have, and this is what they all are. These, roughly speaking, in a, in a Lagrangian correspond to all the kind of magnetic moment type couplings you can have linking different particles to each other. The interesting case is when the masses are equal. If the masses are equal, <clears throat> then, then these are not a basis. UV is zero. And so if I want to write all possible tensors down here, uh, I, can choose, I, can choose this, I can choose lambda. I can use the epsilon symbol. Um, but then there's one other object, which is there's a little bit more information in this uh, P1 uh, lambda tilde. This vector is proportional to U because, it's, because this inner product is zero. Um, they're in the same direction. So the constant of proportionality is another variable that things can uh, depend on, that the amplitude can depend on, and this is uh, carries helicity weight. And once again, if I have uh, equal mass particles, um, uh, whatever they are, again, there's two s plus one structures, again, there's just a bunch of epsilons, some number of these lambdas, and then a power of x to make the helicity weights work out. What's important about this is that this object x is not local. There's no, if you try to compute x in terms of the momenta, you will find that, 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 there's, that there's dependence on reference spinners and it's not local. There's, there's poles downstairs. Okay. <clears throat> Just to give a simple example, let's say we want to see what uh, minimal coupling looks like okay, in, in this language. How do we, we are not running on a Lagrangian, so what does minimal coupling look like? Well, all we do is we have to ask what combination of these couplings have the property that when I go to the mass high energy limit, the massless limit, I recover the massless three particle amplitudes with the lowest dimension uh, couplings. And if I do that, it's, it's something very, very simple. For example, for, for plus helicity, it's just x times a bunch of epsilons. Uh, if it's, uh, if it's uh, spin one, I multiply by that factor if it's spin, spin two, and anyway, it, the parity conjugate of that uh, for the other coupling. All right, finally, three massive is trivial and I won't talk about it. Um, so then now we have the same challenge as before. Uh, given a spectrum of masses and spins and couplings, we want to be able to find a four particle amplitude that factorizes correctly. Okay? And again, as we said before, most naively, you would just take the three particle amplitude, you'd compute the residue, multiply by the pole and sum over the different channels. <clears throat> so, and most of the time that works. And just, just to give you an example that might seem naively scary, but is completely trivial, let's say you're interested, there is a, there's the top quark and a photon, and there's some spin three halves excitation of the top quark, and you want the amplitude for photon top to graviton back top through this crappy guy, right? And you know, you might think, oh my God, you have to open up the Rita Schwinger paper and it's gonna be a nightmare. <laughs> Um, but we just write down the answer, okay? Because this works, there's nothing wrong. These, uh, uh, the, the product of these uh, three-point things gives you something totally local. You multiply it by one over S minus M squared. There's two possible couplings you can have on one end, and that's the most general thing that you can have, plus possible contact terms. So the only challenge, actually, is when we have the situation where there's a massless particle and two particles of equal mass, which, of course, is always there because we have uh, electrons flying around or normal particles uh, flying around. And that's because of this X guy. The X is not local. And so just as we saw for the purely massless case, when we try to do this thing where we jam the residue together and see what it looks like, we'll find that it's not local. It has a pole in another channel and it's not obvious that you can make something work. Okay, now, but you can make it work, it turns out. And, and so we have an explicit expression for all four point tree amplitudes you just give me the three-point coupling, you just write down the answer for all uh, uh, four-point uh, tree amplitudes for any masses and spins uh, without ever mentioning a Lagrangian. Okay. So that's the answer to Nati's question. So we can, uh, we can uh, talk, at least for these production processes, we don't need to go back to a Lagrangian. We can just write down what the answer is uh, ahead of time, the most general answer. Um, and of course, this, we can now start the machinery for doing this for all n. For example, uh, we haven't done it, but I'm sure that uh, you can add any number of massless particles that you want, and all the techniques using the recursion relations and so on will work. Things will start getting interesting if you try to increase the number of massive particles, and it'll be interesting to see what it actually looks like. <clears throat> but let me just give you some examples of what things look like when you uh, compute in this formalism. Let's do something simple like Compton scattering. Two scalars scattering against uh, two photons. So that's what the uh, Compton amplitude is for, for spin zero, spin a half, and spin one. 
Okay? And you'll notice there's no gamma matrices here, there's no U bars and Vs, nothing, right? We're just writing down the answer directly in terms of the, of the actual, I mean, these, are the, these are the tensors, right? So uh, if you want a particular spin component, you just project these, these S's uh, in, the, in the direction of, uh, of the spin axis that you're interested in. Okay, and this S is a very, is a nice, simple expression. Now you'll notice this A has some helicity weight that makes up for the weights of particles two and three. And as I go from zero to a half to one, it drops. I go from A squared to A to nothing. So this is for, you know, photon W scattering. Now you can ask what happens if you go to spin three halves. This is interesting because uh, we know that massless spin three half particles, there's a problem. We're not allowed to have them. Obviously we have to be able to have massive spin three half particles, bound states, any kind of crap out there, there's all kinds of massive higher spin particles. And this formalism is giving you the answer for the scattering amplitude for off bound states, off anything you want, in principle, at least uh, 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 parameterizing it correctly. But you should expect that something changes. And if you just turn the crank, look at our general expression, indeed it changes. So the structure starts looking different starting at spin three halves. Um, I don't expect you to look at it in any detail, but there's a very simple general conclusion that massive higher spin particles can't be point-like. And uh, that just follows from general grounds, and that's because if you put in, for example, minimal coupling, the thing that you would naively make even the three-particle amplitude look point-like at high energy, and now you calculate what the, uh, what the two-to-two scattering amplitude is, you find that despite your best efforts to say the coupling was dimensionless here, small dimensionless coupling, that the high energy limit acquires this extra factor of uh, of energy squared over m squared to the power of 2s minus 2. So it blows up for energies much larger than the mass. Okay? And of course, that's what obstructs taking the m goes to zero limit. So uh, that means that if you see a particle of spin 3 out, a charged particle of spin 3 out, it has to be an extended object. That uh, just, this is the direct physical meaning that it has to be an extended object. Of course, every such example that we know, either they're ordinary bound states and they're extended objects, or they're strings, or they're something else, but of course, uh, that's, that's all true. All right, so that's all I wanted to say about this, and I think um, uh, I have five minutes, so, I'll, so um, I'll have to be even more impressionistic about this than I want it to be. Um, but let me just say a little bit about it. So, uh, so this is now in the opposite extreme. So we're not uh, exploiting these, uh, these principles, but we're trying to see the amplitude as the answer to a different mathematical question, um, and then try to see whether we can understand where, where um, where the singularity properties come from that allow it to get a local and unitary interpretation. This is something that uh, I've been working on for a long time, was the, the, the picture that somehow the amplitudes, if you specify the external data, these Zs are momentum twister variables that are the best ways of talking about uh, uh, the uh, momenta for, uh, for, for, for external states in, in N equals four super Yang mills. Um, that this is somehow the volume of, of, of a region, a region that lives not in space time, not in Hilbert space, some other, uh, some, some other uh, uh, projective space. Um, and uh, so there is a concrete implementation of this idea where indeed, if you specify the external data, roughly the momenta and the helicities of the particles, um, there, is a, there, is a, there is a notion of volume that you can associate to some shape uh, in this space, and that volume calculates the scattering amplitude. So uh, many of you have, may have seen um, uh, aspects of this uh, story before. I won't go through this in any detail other than to just roughly say that, that this, this is a, it's a very, it's a simple shape, it's a simple object, and a simple object that's roughly speaking the generalization of the notion of a simplex. So you start with uh, something like the inside of a triangle, and you generalize the notion of the inside of a triangle in a number of ways. You generalize the inside of a triangle from projective space into the Grassmannian. Uh, you generalize a triangle from a triangle to a polygon, you then generalize that into the Grassmannian in the same way as you generalize triangles, and that leads you into the world of these objects. So, so um, and, uh, and the, the boundaries of this space uh, have the properties that as you go there, the geometry really splits in exactly the same way amplitudes do, and the infinite dimensional symmetry of n equals four super Yang mills is very, is very obvious. There's just the diffeomorphisms that move the points on the inside the amplitude and around without, uh, 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 without changing what the boundaries look like. But the only reason I'm saying all of this is, that, is to remind you this has something to do with the notion of the inside. You're trying to take the notion of the inside of a space and generalize it. And um, that's something that, uh, that I, I think we now have a deeper understanding of. Um, so 
one way of asking, uh, one way of asking the question is, can we give a more invariant characterization of what it means to be inside something? So let me just go back for a moment. You see, if you're, if you're talking about being on the inside of a polygon, one way of specifying it is to say that points are on the inside if they're a positive weighted sum of all the things on the vertices. That's one way of talking about it. Um, that's, uh, that's, so you say that this point is a positive combination of the external data, but this is a very redundant way of talking about things, right? The, if I give you a point, it's hard to check whether it satisfies this uh, property or not. So if you want an effective way of checking it, if you want a more invariant way of checking it, uh, of course, here we know what to do. Uh, the, this, the inside of the polygon is also uh, cut out by a bunch of inequalities. You have to be on the right side of this line, the right side of that line, the right side of that line, and so on. And so if someone hands you uh, a point, you can check. In other words, if you have the face-centered rather than vertex-centered way of thinking about what the polygon is, you have an effective way of checking what it means to be on the inside or the outside. So with Hue, we'd been working for quite a while to try to uh, uh, find the analog of this face-centered way of thinking about things. If there is an analog, it involves uh, topological ideas as well as just being on the right side of boundaries. But it turns out there's an even more primitive understanding of what it means to be on the inside. And it's this more primitive thing I just want to sketch for you to give you a flavor of the kind of thing which is going on. So, but anyway, this is, this is the, the question again. I have some external data that lives in some k plus m dimensional space. k and m are related to amplitudes in some way, but uh, uh, for this purpose, never mind. Uh, but it's some k plane that lives in this k plus m dimensional space, and we want to know when is a k plane in the amplitohedron. Uh, so, <clears throat> So the idea is that uh, we're actually going to take this high dimensional space and we're going to get rid of this plane by projecting through it. So we're going to quotient out by, uh, by, by everything in that plane. So that'll take us from a k plus m dimensional picture to an m dimensional picture. And we can ask what that picture looks like. So saying it again, if you've suffered through any of my talks on this uh, subject over the last number of years, I always start by drawing the stupid picture of a triangle and saying that it's important that we're on the inside. And part of the difficulty, uh, what obstructed us from seeing the right way of thinking about it, is that that was too complicated. We had to start with a simpler example, not the inside of a triangle, but the inside of an interval. <laughs> okay? So let's now talk about what it means to be on the inside of an interval. And here we see there's, a, there's, a, there's another way of talking about what it means uh, to be on the inside of an interval. The y is on the inside of an interval if, if you jump from 1 to 2, you pass over y once. Okay. You see, that generalizes to if a point is on the inside of a convex polygon. A point is on the inside of a convex polygon if, if you project through now one of the vertices and y, the resulting picture, which would look like 2, 3, 4, you jump over y once. And you see, no matter who you project through, you always jump over y precisely once. Okay. So we can generalize that notion. We can say, imagine we have these k planes and k plus m dimensions. I'm going to project through y to get an m-dimensional picture. Let's do the simplest case, m equals 1, the very simplest amplihedron. And what is a picture supposed to look like? Well, the only thing that's left is k. And the idea is that you're in the m equals 1 amplitohedron if you jump over y k times. Okay. So in other words, if you look at this series of, uh, of uh, overlaps between y, uh, everything sort of tensored together, with, uh, uh, contracted with uh, epsilons, but this series of numbers have to has, has to have the sign pattern plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, 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 with precisely k sign flips. OK. And, um, now, how do we define the amplitohedron for general M? In physics, we care about M equals 4, but how do we define it for a general M? Well, all we have to do is project to get to M equals 1 and demand that every possible way that we project to get to M equals 1, we get the same answer. We always get the same pattern of sign flips, always precisely K sign flips, no matter how we do the projection. Okay, so this is, uh, okay, well, I won't have time to explain any of this. but. Uh, but it, it, it really is specified in, in, in binary. If you, if you have uh, uh, the, the, the general geometry is we have, if at L loops, we have L, actually K plus two planes. They all intersect on a common K plane. And this series of numbers has to have precisely K plus K sine flips and K plus two sine flips. All right. And um, I, I unfortunately don't have time, but you could really do a concrete example to really compute an amplitude in this way. Okay? So you, you look at, uh, if you want to calculate the one-loop MHV amplitude, you just write down 
all possible such sign flips. In this case, it has to have, uh, this series has got to have two sign flips, so it's specified by where the flips happen. It's some i and some j. And uh, you then, uh, there's, there's a prescription for attaching a form uh, with this geometry, uh, which is nailed by the geometry. Uh, so it all, it's all about where the sign flip takes place, and so you can really compute an amplitude in this way. All right, I don't have time to talk about this. The final very quick comment I'll make is that uh, <clears throat> Um, in, in, the, in, in our picture of the uh, amplitude to date, uh, supersymmetry has been bosonized. So there's no, it's not super geometry, it's ordinary geometry. And then there was some interesting way of converting the bosonic geometry to super geometry. In fact, it turns out that it's uh, even simpler than, than, than we realize, and the story doesn't really have these whys in it. So everything that I was telling you about, they're, they're all, of course, sitting there behind the scenes. But I can specify what the, what the structure is directly on the following very simple space. I just have the space of external data. These are these momentum twisted variables. They're in R4. Loops are two planes in this space. These are roughly uh, twisters and lines in twister space that correspond to points in space time that are the loop integration variables. And so I have a configuration space of, of, uh, that depends on endpoints, L, uh, two planes in R4. On this configuration space, there turned out to be a canonical form of degree 4 times k plus l. This form is completely determined by having logarithmic singularities on the boundaries of the region specified by this binary code. What I mean is as you move these z's and points around, you have to have the property that as you do these projections, you always have the same patterns of sign flips, no matter how you do it, no matter how you do the projection. And that determines what the form looks like. So this is, this is just a differential form. You've never heard of supersymmetry. But now there's a very natural Grassmann object in town, dz. If you just take dz and you interpret it as the eta that, it, that appears in superamplitudes, this is the superamplitude. Okay? So this is a way of going from bosonic Grassmannian geometry to uh, supersymmetry, Yangians, and so on. But it's all bosonic. All right, so let me just end. At least in this example, for planar n equals four super Yang mills, we do have a concrete example where we see locality and unitarity as derived notions, very much joined at the hip, uh, ultimately arising from these algebraic, geometric, combinatorial origins, really counting pluses and minuses. Um, if I had another 20 minutes, I could actually prove locality and unitarity by looking at the pattern of these sign flips and seeing how they imply the, the uh, factorizations that, that, that you need. So there's a couple of, uh, I think, large open questions um, uh, in this story. Uh, we, we've understood a lot about the singularity geometry of uh, scattering forms, and we're also seeing uh, the scattering forms as combinatorial geometry. We understand much little directly about the final amplitudes when you finish doing the loop integrations. Um, uh, there's this, uh, the singularity geometry here should correspond to some intricate branch cut geometry. We don't understand that. Uh, and, uh, and the analog of the question here, we're seeing this, these scattering forms are really determined by some combinatorial geometry. We have no idea. We have functions that are polylogarithms, elliptic functions, more complicated in intricate functions here. What, mathem what mathematical questions are the full n equals four amplitudes answering? Uh, I'll just mention this very briefly because there's an aspect uh, that we're seeing everywhere here. Uh, there's a kind of cluster structure. Uh, that's being seen all over the place, not only the amplitudes business and things that have nothing to do with amplitudes, that's sort of most remarkably to me, uh, something that showed up in drawing these pictures of on-shell processes uh, were equivalence relations on these diagrams that are sort of literally uh, cyber duality for uh, quiver gauge theories if you draw the duals of these diagrams and thinking of them as, uh, as giving you uh, n equals one quiver gauge theories. And um, I think the, the deepest question of all is really this one. I won't even talk about that which is that there is an aspect of the physics here, which I haven't talked about at all, we don't see nine equals four super Yang mills, which is running, the RG. And I think that um, uh, uh, until, at least in my mind, until we get a good on-shell picture of how we're supposed to think about the RG, uh, I, I won't be, be satisfied. In a sense, um, without the RG, we're running with the wind to our back at 200 miles an hour in this business because amplitudes aren't a very local question to begin with. So the fact that we managed to come up with a picture for what they are that doesn't have the interior of the space time in it is maybe not so surprising. It's the RG, which uh, is Euclidean, uh, is uh, off shell, and the best way of thinking about it uses those notions as Wilson taught us. So 
Uh, if we could understand how to get that from this uh, Lorentzian or maybe 2-2 two -two point of view, that would be extremely interesting. The only hope I have along these lines is that the sort of structure of the famous wilson polchinski equation for the renormalization group has you know, very striking, obvious, often remarked on formal similarities to the, uh, to the singularity structure of scattering amplitudes. All right, that's it. Happy birthday, Nati. Thank you very much. Um, brief questions. So I still don't get the answer to my question. Yeah. <laughs> the answer is, is maybe. <laughs> um, so, but, but I mean, in the, really in the narrow sense of what I was doing in that talk, in the narrow sense of what we're doing in the talk, we're just computing, we're saying instead of, instead of, uh, uh, because all these things are done at tree level for colliders, right? And then you, then you, you, know, you shower them, there's radiation and so on. But the, the hard part is all the tree process. And that's what you need, you need a Lagrangian for and blah, 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 blah. Now, of course, what we were doing was not this. What we were doing was indeed just phenomenological and saying, look, you don't actually need all that detailed information about what the matrix element looks like if you want to get the distributions that experimentalists measure at the LHC right. But your question was, was the correct deeper question, can you actually do it without ever talking about the off-shell virtual particles? And the answer for those processes is absolutely. You can write all of them down. And, okay. and what about some strongly very interacting CFT, which of course not. No, no, no. Th th but that's, that's, that's precisely not what was being talked about in that, in that meeting. We're talking about, you know, things like supersymmetry, things like uh, uh, simple things where you do use a Lagrangian anyway, right? Uh, how, how do you, can you elaborate on how you see Zyberg's duality, which is an infrared property, without having an RG? Uh, oh, no, sorry. Uh, I, I, I don't see Zyberg duality at all. Uh, what I was saying is that in this, uh, these, th th there's this, uh, um, there's this, uh, there, there are these pictures that show up all over the place. And there are, and there's, uh, uh, there's, there are cluster algebras, there's, uh, uh, there are, there are, there are a series of objects on which you do simple, simple moves and you generate large algebras and collections of things, okay? Just very abstractly. Now, those cluster algebras show up everywhere. They show up in scattering amplitudes in the integrand. They show up in scattering amplitudes at strong coupling. They show up, uh, they show up in wall crossing. They show up um, uh, they sh in totally different questions. They're not, they're not related to each other. They're not obviously related to each other. Um, uh, a very simple thing, which doesn't need, uh, which doesn't have a, a lot of the extra structure on top of it, is simply that you draw diagrams, these diagrams, bipartite diagrams with black and white vertices. Uh, those correspond to certain on-shell processes for scattering amplitudes. And as a scattering amplitude question, uh, there's many different ways of representing exactly the same function that are related by moves. <laughs> Now, you take exactly the same picture with black and white vertices, you draw the dual graph, the black and white tells you to put arrows on the graph so you get a quiver. And now you think of it as an n equals one gauge theory. And cyborg duality on that n equals one gauge theory is the same move that leaves the, which interpret as an amplitude, which leaves the amplitudes invariant. That's a small part of the fact that it's the same cluster structure which shows up over and over again. I, I, I think it's rather fascinating that the same cluster structures showing up everywhere and completely unrelated things. I know Nazi's attitude about this is, uh, well, Maybe he's not sure, but you say maybe it's like the Laplacian or something. There are things that, that show up everywhere with no, just because it's, uh, there's not so many mathematical structures out there and they'll be uh, used over and over again. My answer to that is that if these things end up being as important as, a, as the Laplacian, that would be pretty awesome. <laughs> but, um, but it's also possible they're, they're related to each other for deeper reasons. Uh, all of these things come down from the 2-0 theory in one way or the other. And uh, so, um, okay. uh, yeah, that's... Okay, L uh, let's thank uh, Nima.